Are you thinking of leaving corporate, but too afraid to make the move? Have you already escaped corporate, but are finding it hard to run your dream business? Are you wasting valuable time by attempting to figure challenges out on your own? We have created a podcast for corporate escapees running their own business. This is the Corporate Escapees Podcast by Build, Live, Give. We bring you firsthand experiences of guests going through many of the struggles you face each and every day as a corporate escapee. We get real with no corporate BS. And now over to your host, Paul Higgins. Hello and welcome to Corporate Escapees, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of people who are successfully running their own businesses, hearing their war stories and motivations for making the jump from their corporate gig. I'm your host, Paul Higgins, and our guest today is someone that spent quite a bit of time in a traditional legal sense. She did litigation, realized that she didn't love that. Then she went into an in-house firm and she realized that wasn't quite right for her. And then the decision was made for her. She was actually made redundant and she really looked at, well, should I go back and, and jump into another law firm or start my own? Well, history would say that she made the right choice. She started her own firm and she gives some brilliant insights in how she helps people who help other people. What I'll do now is hand you over to Sarah Bartholomew's from You Legal. Welcome, Sarah Bartholomew's from You Legal to the Corporate Escapees podcast brought to you by Build Live Give. So, Sarah, we're going to get to know a lot about you today, but why don't we just start with something your family or friends would know about you that our listeners wouldn't. Okay, I when I very first started being a lawyer, was also a wedding DJ. A wedding DJ? Yes. Tell, tell me more. <laughs> well, junior lawyers don't get paid a lot and I had this big goal that I wanted to really make a dent on paying off my house before I had kids and being a wedding DJ pays very well because it is an extreme high pressure job. Uh, there's a lot of expectations for a wedding day. It requires extremely good communication skills and sometimes during times of uh, unhappy brides. And um, yeah, it was a really happy way to spend every Saturday night and some Friday nights for about three or four years. Great. And what's a, a wedding that comes to mind as soon as you you go back into those archives what's something that was a memorable wedding that uh, may not have been for the right reasons but what's, what's <laughs> a memorable one Oh, I do remember one, now that you say not for the right reasons, where I had a bride that had to hold up her husband. He'd got very excited in the pre-drinking, I think, with his groomsmen. And so the wedding dance probably wasn't her dream wedding dance that night because she had to try and keep him on his feet. <laughs> well, uh, my quick story is uh, we did about uh, six weeks of dancing lessons before we got married and uh, I didn't want to do them anyway. We, we ended up doing it. It was a great time to spend time together and, you know, that sort of busy lead up gets to the bridal waltz and the, the MC said, uh, you know, you get up. So we stood up, took one step of the music and then he said, okay, now everyone get up and dance. No. I'm like six weeks I've been practising this damn dance. <laughs> That is but, terrible. Because it was videotaped, it's probably a good thing that I never got to do that dance. Because uh, <laughs> my, my wife um, at one point, yeah, brought an iron to the dancing classes. And I'm like, what are you doing with an iron? She goes, well, you're so, so stiff. You're like an ironing board. I thought I'd uh, do some ironing while I'm here. I said, that's, that's not fair. It's a good Definitely way to fair. keep you focused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, look, it was great. It was, it was like mini marriage cancelling beforehand. But anyway, back to you. So I know you've had a, a very extensive career in law. So why don't you just talk us or take us through a little bit about your uh, corporate escapee story? Oh, my corporate escapee story. Well, I started out working in a, a corporate law firm, so working in the dispute section uh, initially and realised that I hated fighting with people all the time. That's what litigation did to me. I felt like I was fighting with my clients about their bills, fighting with the other side because it's litigation and that's what you do, fighting with my partners about my billables. And so I really wanted to work on something more commercial. So I worked moved in-house to work in an in-house role, so working in a company, so my actual corporate experience. Worked at a public company here in Adelaide called ABB Grain, which was taken over 
um, by a Canadian company called Viterra and then moved to another corporate here in Adelaide that was undergoing severe financial difficulties mm. and worked to uh, worked with the transformation team to sell off all the non-core assets and at the sale of the last one um, was made redundant. So I did myself out of a job when I was seven months pregnant with my second child and had just got the news that my dad who lived in England at the time had cancer. So it's kind of, it's not the happiest corporate escape story probably. It was more being flung into the wilderness than um, hatching hatching a plan to escape. Mm, and uh, was the redundancy a surprise or was it something that you'd orchestrated? I think I knew that my job was to help the company get back on its feet and I knew that the influx of money from the sale of the largest non-core asset would do that. So in a way it wasn't a surprise but anyone who's ever been made redundant sort of think it might happen and then it happens. It's a whole different story. It's a bit like probably having a terminally ill family friend who you know will die eventually but then when it actually happens it's still a shock Mm, and look uh i'm a bit uh you know what happened with your dad if you don't mind me asking did it oh so he's fine now so he had um surgery very quickly after there hadn't been any um there's no need to have like the the chemo drugs or anything they managed to have it localized cut it out and yeah his free now so that's good fingers crossed um yes sorry great um, great that's that's brilliant news and what was sort of the time between you being made redundant and then decided setting up your own gig well I got four weeks notice I'm not sure if that's usual but I worked out my notice um at my job and during that time managed to think about what I wanted to do and I guess the question for me was whether I should go on maternity leave for six months or a year and then start looking for a job or um, take my life into my own hands. And I thought I'm going to, I don't think that working in a big firm is going to work for me again. I don't know that there's many part-time corporate council roles available. I, I felt like starting my own firm was actually taking the power back and having control over my life in a way. I mean, that's, that was the thought process, whether or not that's actually true. Um, guess the, the roller coaster of starting your own business doesn't necessarily feel like that, but that was the theory. Yeah. And how long ago was that? Was that four years ago or? Yeah, about four and a half years ago now. Yeah. Great. And, and if you can go back four years ago, what were some of the key fears when you made that brave step to say, no, look, I'm going to go give this a, a go on my own? I think that one big fear that I probably still have to a certain extent is the fear of rejection. Like I hate it when people say no to me. Um, so getting used to, to that where um, when I was pitching for work, um, was probably and probably still is a, a big thing that I hate. Yeah, and, and how do you, because obviously, you know, obviously to, to grow a business uh, and certainly a, a, a legal practice or any professional service business, you're going to get lots of no's. So how, any advice you've got for people that are just fresh out of corporate, you know, they, uh, you know, they're really excited to get the revenue in, but people do say no. How do you um, handle that yourself and what's advice you've got for others? Yeah, I think for me, I was a really great COO when I first started my business. Like I love putting in procedures and policies and processes to get things done. And I just remember my husband saying to me, um, you know, you're being a great COO, but this company needs a CEO and you've got to get out there and you've got to sell. So that was facing the fear. And one way that I have worked to overcome it is as part of my daily practice I make it a practice to make phone calls to people which I used to have huge call reluctance so I make sure that I try and do 10 calls before 10 o'clock in the morning and that is really the foundation of what keeps work coming in. Great excellent and is it a you know have you seen the ability for you to to get work improve as you've made more calls? Yes. In fact, I get to a point where if I'm making a lot of calls, I find it hard to service. (laughs) 
<laughs> so <laughs> it creates a, a bit of a problem, um, but a good problem. Um, so yeah, finding that balance with professional services well about um, how much work you can do and, and to, the, to the best of your ability and making sure you're servicing clients to, to make sure that they're getting a great quality service as well. Great. And was there ever a time during that, those four years that you thought, mm, actually, you know what, this is really hard. Maybe I should just go back and work for someone? Um, well, my, our model really challenges the traditional model of law. We've got a team of lawyers that work from all over Australia and the world. And when we first started four years ago, there was nothing like it. No one was using the internet really to provide legal services in the way that we do and so there were a lot of times I just thought I think it would just be a lot easier to just go into an existing firm have someone else do the marketing just do the work and um, not worry about all the all the chatter um, and the criticism and the daily battle I felt like I was having to have people understand the model. So what stopped you? What what was the point that kept you, oh, you know, kept you going? I guess I want to transform the way that legal services are provided both for clients and for lawyers. And I remember walking into the kitchen one day and saying that famous thing in my head, like, and tears coming to my eyes, if it's not me, then who will it be? And, oh, my God, <laughs> and if, if not now, then when? Because, um, you know, so many professional services people suffer with mental health issues because mm-hmm. of the way that the traditional model works and um, so many clients are not getting value for the money that they spend on legal services. So, um, yeah, that's, I guess that's exactly what keeps me going. Yeah, that's brilliant. I think, you know, that's all of us, I think that higher purpose and, uh, and, and leaving that legacy as you've just described is, uh, is brilliant. And as far as help, who sort of helped you in the last four years to, you know, scale this as, as quick as you have? I think it was a bit of a shock to everyone what happened with scaling, um, especially me. <laughs> I um, really had to build the plane on the way, on the jump off the cliff, uh, if that visual makes sense. Yes. Uh, and I worked, um, I worked, I guess my husband is in business, so I could bounce ideas off him when I had ideas. And I joined after about six months I joined the entrepreneurs organizations accelerator program so I was surrounded by other small but willing to grow businesses and I think as you know being a part of a community of like-minded people can help keep you focused on the right things I found that sharing um, what my issues were. So my core reluctance, for example, different other people experienced that. I wasn't alone and and other people had different techniques for how to deal with it. So getting the learnings from people in the same situation with the same mindset and the same values was invaluable for me for growing and scaling. Great. And uh, what we'll do now is go into the build section. So when someone comes up to you and goes, Sarah, you know, what do you do now? How do you describe what you legal and and yourself do? Um, I say we're an award-winning law firm and we provide leaders in growing companies with the confidence they need to make bold decisions in their businesses. Great. And what do people normally follow up with next? Like, how do you do that or? Yeah. Yeah, and, and how do you answer that? We have a network of top-tier freelance lawyers that um, work with us in relation to legal issues. So we like to make sure that people future-proof their businesses to avoid that dispute area that I hated so much working in. Um So we draft shareholders agreements and review leases and um, draft contractor agreements or employment agreements so that people know um, what they're getting into. They're building a foundation for their business that creates value for the future. Great. And uh, who are your ideal clients? We always want to work with people who help people. 
So our ideal clients are scaling their businesses and they've got a purpose that's higher than profits in mind. So the background of that is we've always worked with corporates before because that's where my background was. And last year we did a half a billion dollar transaction. So a huge corporate takeover for a client. And at the end of it, I just thought this isn't, this isn't really working for me, for my values. I want to do a bit of a values review and we did it with the team and we worked out we just needed to be helping people that were making a difference in the world, not just people who were purely working for money. Great. And, um, and just take us a little bit through that decision process, like how, you know, what were some of the criteria that you you use because I know some people really struggle with making some of those big shifts in who their ideal client is and I'd love to get some more insight from you. Yeah, sure. We looked at um, who our, what our existing client base looked like as well and worked out who we really enjoyed working with because that was also important. We want to be making um, decisions to spend our time acting for people that um, we also really like because um, they spend so much time at work. And, um, yeah, that, that kind of review process happened naturally with both the lawyers and our operations team. And we also looked at who, who we didn't want to act for. We didn't want to take on clients that um, won't take responsibility for their actions and ones, of course, that wouldn't pay their bills we don't want to take on board. So it was a great process to go through and it's been a fantastic shift and yeah, it's been really, um, really great. I, I wrote a book called growing a medical practice because we realized that doctors help people very, very directly and, um, having a book for them to help them grow their practice because their skills and expertise aren't necessarily in growing their business has been a great, lead driver um, in terms of getting those people uh, in in the door that know that we want to help people who help people and that this book actually just directly helps them. So it's a good starter. Great. And and how long did it take you to write the book? Well, I wrote it in a month. So I got up at five o'clock in the morning uh, every day of December last year and wrote a thousand words a day for 30 days. I took Christmas Day off. And um, took about six weeks to edit it. So it was just launched two weeks ago at the Business for Doctors conference in Sydney. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. And any other tips? Because I'm halfway through my book and I know a lot of listeners are either, what, what's that saying? That everyone's got a great book in them, but uh, not often that gets out. What's some advice for people that are sort of sitting on the fence? I think if you have someone else you know who wants to write a book, having an accountability partner or group where you try and work through what's holding you back because I know this was my third book and even with this book I found um, it really hard to get past the who am I to be writing this book Mm -hmm. question. That that imposter syndrome is, um, is is a book killer, I think. Yeah, well, look, I'm very fortunate. A quick shout out to Kath Walters, who's helping me. And uh, it's brilliant. Kath and I do every fortnight, we do about a three hour interview. So she interviews me, Ah. uh, which is great. Then she basically goes, gets that all edited. And then I get the transcript back. I can edit it from there. But it's, uh, yeah, it's great. We sort of do a couple of chapters at a time. And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it'll be about 90 days um, for me to to launch Yay. my book but uh yeah look it's, it's it's been great so that's another option as well if you're not as dedicated as uh, sarah is to get up at five o'clock every morning and um we've talked about your business model sarah but just you know tell us a little bit more about the difference and and you know what's unique about it versus some other people that are saying you know we're not like other law firms I, you know i hear that all the time these days and then i look at it and think well hang on you waddle your quack it, you look like another law firm but you're just trying to you know leverage off the the uh the theme at the moment that i'm not another law firm but i know you are so just yeah help uh describe why you're different to a typical law firm 
Yeah, so I spoke to one of our corporate clients yesterday who's got a new general counsel and he described us perfectly as um, being different. We can be a lot more agile because we don't have uh, the traditional law firm model works in the way where they just pay people low, sell high, they tend to try and jam as many matters through um, to the lawyers as possible, which means that they're always stretched for time um, and they often don't get to uh, ones that aren't those giant matters, whether they be big litigation or big takeovers. They um, don't have the agility that we have. So we have a team of freelance lawyers who work when there is work and we try and turn things around in 24 to 48 hours so that our clients get the work that they need back very quickly and at a very high standard, which the the big firms just can't do in the same way. Yeah, and where's, you know, you talk about in a lot of industries they talk about artificial intelligence and, you know, how that's going to disrupt uh, the industry. Well, what do you think artificial intelligence and machine learning, what the impact that's going to have upon the law industry? I think it will make a huge difference in very simple um, things like in at least initially with answering questions about what acts say and um, potentially even drafting simple documents. But what I think it's struggling to do at the moment but probably will happen through time is a learning about how how to make strategic legal decisions. I had a client in this morning wanting to talk about succession planning for a family business and there being lots of different personalities involved which really needs somebody to think through how to position things to be able to get to yes. So that system of negotiation, um, I think AI is going to at least initially have a lot more trouble with than just simple answering of questions. Yeah, and if we certainly look at the accounting industry, you know, I suppose that's happened quite some time where you've got automation and bookkeeping, et cetera, and, you know, now certainly looking at accountants uh, adding a lot more value rather than just tax advice moving up and yeah. I think lawyers have, have traditionally done that well so so I think there's um, still a lot of room for that and I think in the agile approach and being a, a true advisor or, or a partner is is brilliant and um, and as far as the improving the profitability of your your own business what are some steps you've done to improve the profitability of your business what we've been doing in the last year or so is creating products where clients get a, a an outcome so a service but a, a fixed price service that has guaranteed outcomes so that helps us because we're not doing everything absolutely bespoke we've got those starting places um, and also um, we know that whatever it is will add massive value for clients because it's something they've got a real pain point around and it's something that they need. Great. And, um, you know, obviously you've you've grown and like you said, you've even surprised yourself in the growth in the four years. What's been your, your key driver of new business? Oh, that is a good question. I, I think the network that I've been growing, so meeting people who are doing similar things and um, people who are up for new ways of thinking. We've got clients where the CFO has come from a um, very traditional accounting background, but they can see the value in the model and the, the service that we provide compared to a more traditional firm. So that point of difference that sometimes being different doesn't like is more important than than being better. <laughs> Excellent. And, you know, you talked before around sales where, you know, making calls was a big struggle for you and you've overcome that, which is, Brian, I love the 10 before 10. But uh, <laughs> anything else that you comes to mind when uh, you're struggling with sales and maybe how you've overcome that? Oh, for sales. 
good question. I've got a, a spreadsheet of people, so that's where my uh, my ten before ten come in. Uh, but I think um, continuous learning has been really important to me, and making sure that I'm always doing something training wise um, and for me especially in sales learning uh, about how to um, have conversations that automatically lead to yes how to understand when people want to buy from me I have traditionally been say, been very professional servicey about it and not picked up on cues or said but you probably don't need this now when people want it even if they don't need it so just that continuous education part I think is so important especially because the world's changing so quickly yeah and and what are some key resources for you around that education I am obsessed with audible so I've always got a new audio book that I'm listening to. <laughs> um, sales wise, I've recently listened to Sales Dogs, uh, which is a Robert Kiyosaki book. And I listened to the Robert Kiyosaki book recently, Scaling Up by Vern Harnish is in there. Um, Traction by Gino Wickman, Leaders Eat Last by um, Simon Sinek. So I've always got a new book in there, um, making making my walk to work more interesting brilliant and uh and your team i know you've got a lot of freelancers but uh your your core team how big's your core team the core team there's five operational staff including me we've got um elise who is my assistant and kind of keeps my calendar ticking over she lives in hong kong and she's also great at design and um, all the IT stuff we need. Uh, I've got a practice manager. Her name's Kirsten. She works, she, she's an employee and she works from Melbourne. Uh, Kim works from Sydney. She's moving to Switzerland, but we don't think that will have any impact. Um, and Andrea, our marketing person. So one of the gaps that I found I had was I love doing marketing and being creative, but I wasn't great at setting KPIs or working out what actually made a difference in marketing what measuring the opens of our newsletter or um the reach that certain posts got on social so uh, andrea comes from a big bank background and is brilliant at doing that uh, and making sure that we're doing more of what's making a difference for people and less of what's not Mm, look, I think that's uh, brilliant. I know there's so many owners that I interview that um, you know are great at marketing, but they try to do it all. So I think that's a really rich insight, and I'm hoping people that are you know running their own business listen to that, take heed. As far as how you found someone like Andrea, just a bit of an insight as to how you came about finding her. I found Andrea through Upwork. Oh, really? Hmm. Which is an online freelance site. So I put a job ad up and she applied. And I moved from in the initial stages of the business, I thought cheaper is better because then I have more profit. But I had moved when I found Andrea to realising that to get value out of people, they have to be better than me. And if they're better than me, then they probably charge more than 5 or $7 an hour. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. that was also a key learning for me. That yeah, and look, if you pay for good people, it saves you money in the long run. Yeah, and look, I think it's that you know, it's the you might need someone full time, but I suppose it's the you know, yes, they might have a higher rate per hour, but you're using them less. And if you're more mm-hmm. proactive, etc., you can manage that. So I totally agree. But I will say that you know, sometimes the best in the world for a small business servicing small business isn't that much more expensive than someone who's not. So. Um, you know, I also uh, do do uh, agree that you can find some great people. We just interviewed a guy on uh, Free Up, which is similar to mm-hmm. to Upwork, and there's a lot of other great resources which I'll uh, talk about a bit more in, in a moment. But as far as building this team, what's what's some key advice you've got around you know building a, a, a team, and especially a remote team, a dispersed yeah. team that don't all uh, live in your office? Yeah, we work. Um 
we all work remotely and we all work flexibly. So what we have found makes a huge difference is we have a weekly huddle. So we all check in on our what we promised to do last week and either it gets a green or it gets a red and that not wanting to get a red thing really motivates me. I was up early this morning doing something to avoid getting red at our huddle earlier today. And that sinks in with quarterly planning. We do a quarterly planning session, which is based on the seven levers of our business. So we look at uh, accounts payable days, accounts receivable days, um, overhead cost, profit percentage, um, revenue, and um, we have a look at those each quarter and focus on one. Um, and everyone in the team owns a lever. So at our huddle, people report on how we're doing on those levers and report on the actions from last month, which is based on what we've, we're have we focusing on for the quarter. Brilliant. I think uh, some of those lessons are in the uh, book traction as well, which uh, we'll put the, the links into. But uh, that's brilliant. I love how you've done that. And as far as your biggest challenge today, running uh, you legal what's the biggest challenge for me the biggest challenge is that the business still relies a lot on me which means I don't really take proper holidays still and that's a big focus having getting a practice manager in has been life-saving in the last few months she does a lot of the more sophisticated I suppose admin that I used to do all of Um, and so freeing myself up from being that key person that's required for everything is next on my list of challenges to overcome and so many challenges in business I'm sure you know are all mental and um, just come overcoming them and delegation and empowering other people is um, where that challenge lies I know. Excellent. Before we go into the next section, I would like to mention our community, which helps corporate escapees like Sarah to build, live and give. You get direct coaching by myself and access to hundreds of vetted suppliers. Just go to blgboost.com to find out more. So the next section is the live section. So tell us a little bit more about your daily habits, Sarah, other than getting up very early, which I've seen as a common theme. What else are your daily habits really help you be successful? I meditate for 20 minutes every morning before I get out of bed, um, which I find sets me on a course for a good day. I've also started doing um, a visualisation as part of that as well. So that's an extra 15 minutes where I... um, go through that visualization to help set me up for a successful day. Uh, I don't look at social media or my phone messages or my emails until after I've had breakfast. So I try and listen to something positive in the morning. I love um, Oprah's podcast or your podcast or a book. I'm listening to um, Stand Note. Talk Like Churchill, Stand Like Lincoln at the moment, which is about public speaking. And um, so I find that sets my headspace right for the day. Then during my breakfast, feeding the kids at the same time, I write in a journal, a gratitude journal about everything I'm grateful for, from from the rain this morning on the the roof to um, my husband making my breakfast before he went off to the gym. Um, And they're probably the key things that I find make the biggest difference. I do them during the week and on the weekends as well. Brilliant. And when uh, David, your husband, listens to this podcast, what would you like to say to him about the support he's given you through this journey? Oh, you want me to cry again? (laughs) I, (laughs) I couldn't have done it without him. We have flipped in the last four years from a more traditional family to quite an untraditional family where Dave does a lot of the caring and and family household responsibilities to make um, what I do a possibility and um, I couldn't have done it without him. Uh, So thanks, Dave. 
Excellent. And uh, the next section is the give section. So what's a cause or community you'd love to mention and why? Oh, a few. I'm the chair of a not-for-profit called the Catalyst Foundation, which helps empower people who are getting older and people with disabilities with information about how they can access services. So that's a big passion of mine. And also at Ulegal, we give to build one, give one. Buy one, give one. Sorry. You got me confused. <laughs> the right. there. Yeah, um, it's easier just saying B1, G1. <laughs> B1, G1. We, uh, as a team, chose the one cause that we wanted to give to as part of, of B1, G1 because in the past we had a lot of different causes we g- gave to for different reasons. So we would give to um, Amnesty International, Mercy Ships, um, all different types of giving but we wanted to channel it into one cause that our whole team and our clients felt really passionate about so we give to um, an indigenous indigenous australian um, cause now which provides uh, a learning hub for um, indigenous australians in queensland brilliant and a quick shout out to paul dunn as i said paul's been a a guest on this podcast and we uh, love the work that B1G1 does and we'll have links to that. The last section is the action section and this is where I'll ask you some questions, just some rapid fire answers. So the first one is what are your top three productivity tips? Oh, gosh. I um, Meditation is number one. Um, number two is uh, a negative one, not too much coffee or it um, can make you crazy. and the third one is having a list. What I do each day is I have um, my day, I write it out, what's going to happen at certain times so that I can see where there's gaps. I can see what my top three priorities for the day are and I know what to focus on. And I know that that helps me get through whatever I'm going to procrastinate about as well. Brilliant. And uh, what are the, some of the favourite apps that you um, use and whether it's on your phone or your desktop and, and uh, why? Oh, I like zero because I like to keep on top of um, the invoices being yeah. paid and not being paid. I really like the One Giant Mind meditation app as well. I am kind of obsessed with weather no matter where I go, so I like to keep an eye on my weather app. Um, and for making videos, this is a good hack. I use a teleprompt, um, a teleprompt app, so I can read uh, and do my video. So I've got a bit of a safety net. I think if I'm doing videos and get a mental blank. Great. And do you do that on your phone? I do it on my phone. Yes, I used to use an iPad, but my phone I think has a better camera now. It's kind of seems to have more storage space and everything so phone's the way to go brilliant and uh i know that you mentioned some great audible books and uh any and and some podcasts any other podcasts that you'd love to recommend and why well i I'm my second book is called kingpin legal lessons from the underworld so i'm it's about it's about how drug dealers manage risk in their business and what ordinary business owners can learn from that. So I really love underworld stuff. So (laughs) hearing stories about true crime. So there's a true crime podcast I like called um, Case File. Uh, There's one, an ABC podcast called Trace at the moment that I'm listening to, uh, Crime Town, um, so not so business focused these ones are they? But no, uh, yeah, <laughs> but that, that business wise, I really like the startup podcast, um, and I yeah, I, I love Planet Money to try and understand how the economy works, and there's a few legal ones, writs and cures that I like, um, and the happy happy lawyer happy life one so great brilliant and uh it it must be a long walk to work is it (laughs) no it's only 10 minutes (laughs) but i but you can also do it while you're folding laundry and there's all sorts of time if you're driving 
Yeah, spot on. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm addicted to podcasts and uh, I listen to two and a half times speed and just... Um, oh, motor. that's a good idea. Imagine how many more I could listen to if I did that. Yeah, yeah. Look, you start at one and a half and you work your way up. <laughs> uh, but my, my own voice, I can listen to it three times and if I ever do listen to it, which I, I don't like doing. Sound but, like a chipmunk. Uh, yeah, correct, correct. People, <laughs> my kids get in the car and they go, oh, my God, Dad, you know, what is that? <laughs> And I'm like, that's sorry, that's just the way I, I learn. It's uh, it's amazing. And video as well. You can use uh, controllers too. I can't watch video at one time speed. So TV now annoys me when I, I can't speed it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, uh, you know, Sarah, it's, it's been brilliant understanding more about uh, what you do. We can certainly find more about or listeners can find more about Sarah at uh, ulegal.com.au. And uh, you can sign up to her brilliant newsletter. I get that. So you can sign that up. And also uh, you can check out a LinkedIn profile. But that and all the other rich content that Sarah's mentioned through the podcast, we'll have that in the show notes. But uh, Sarah, just what's some parting advice you'd love to leave the BLG audience? I think just getting your headset right every morning is really important when you're escaping the corporate um, world because as I, my experience from leaving corporate was that my life before when I worked in corporate occurred in black and white and now that I run my own business, it occurs in bright technicolour. The highs are higher, the lows are lower. So uh, if, if in doubt, then just do it or drop the just and do it. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, uh, as I said, it's been great having you on the show. I think you do a, a fantastic job really setting the path, not just in Australia, but globally on how uh, it, how law firms should be run. And I, sh- and I think, think, you know, you've got to we come up with a better word than firm because you're not a firm. You're a, a great collective of brilliant brains uh, helping people. So uh, well done on that. And it's been great to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Corporate Escapees podcast brought to you by the team at Build, Live, Give. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with other corporate escapees. If you would like to join a community of like-minded peers, please visit www.buildlivegive.com. Until next time, thanks for listening and be brave.